Good evening. My name is Joseph Capizzi. I'm the Executive Director at the Institute for Human Ecology. It's my pleasure to welcome, welcome you to our event tonight um, on behalf of the Institute for Human Ecology at the Catholic University of America and the Catholic Information Center in Washington, DC. It's our pleasure to have you join us for this spirited debate, uh, a conversation that is going to take place between two wonderful scholars. Uh, the conversation is going to be organized out around a resolution, which I'll uh, get to in a minute. Um, but first, um, let me introduce our two scholars who are joining us tonight. First, we have Kate Ward, who's a professor of theology at Mil uh, Marquette University in Milwaukee. Um, Dr. Ward, or Kate, will be arguing the affirmative case of the resolution. And also joining us tonight is my colleague in the Institute for Human Ecology and a professor at the Catholic University of America's uh, Bush School of Business. Catherine Pakalik, um, who will be arguing uh, against Kate, uh, the contra side, right, the negative side of our resolution. So a couple of comments about our format. Kate will begin arguing the affirmative side. She'll argue for about six minutes. After her, Catherine will, will, will argue the contra side for also for about six minutes. Then I will come back in um, and I will start a question and answer period during which I will ask a couple of questions of both of our panelists. And I also invite you to uh, join in and submit your questions to us and we'll try to get some of your questions involved in this conversation as well. And then once we're done with the question and answer period, we'll turn back to Kate and Catherine to finish us off with their own summation of their positions. Most of you by now will already have voted one, one way or the other. Um, you'll see there's a poll where you can, you can register your vote. We're doing both a pre-conversation poll and a post-conversation poll. So if you have not already voted, please do vote. And then once uh, the conversation is concluded, please do vote again. If your mind has changed, um, it'll be of course of interest to all of us to see how the conversation has informed your own thinking about these questions. So enough of me. Um, let's go to our resolution. The resolution is that a universal basic income, or a UBI, as we'll probably refer to it um, the rest of the evening, meets the Catholic demand of a just wage. As I said, uh, Kate will argue uh, the first position here. She'll argue the affirmative case. So, Kate, I turn this over to you now. Thank you very much. Classic. Thank you so much, Joe. Uh, thanks so much, everybody, for being here. So my position is, yes, universal basic income, by which I mean a subsistence grant in cash given to every adult without means testing, is supported by the social teaching of the Catholic Church. I'll focus on three key reasons, the right to achieve basic needs, the principle of subsidiarity, and the Catholic view of work. It's a bedrock view of Catholic social thought that humans have the right to basic needs, like food and water, shelter, healthcare, and education. Helping people meet these needs is a key role of democratically elected governments. This can be through taxation and redistribution, forbidding certain kinds of economic activity and supporting and promoting others, or other things that people discern could help support the right to basic needs. Government redistribution can even be one part of helping workers achieve a just wage, meaning a wage that allows one worker and their family to live in reasonable, frugal comfort and to save for the future. So for example, John Paul II said that a just wage can be achieved either by employers offering it on their own or through other social measures such as family allowances or grants. So government redistribution to meet basic needs is a-okay with Catholic social teaching. What might make universal basic income preferable to other forms of redistribution like food stamps, housing allowances, or family grants? Without disallowing those other programs, I would point to one of the lesser known principles of Catholic social thought the principle of subsidiarity. Subsidiarity uh, is the principle that issues should be dealt with at the most local level capable of handling them adequately. Many problems are best dealt with by those closest to the situation. For example, neighborhood leaders might organize a community litter pickup and then they don't need to pass a law or apply for a grant, they'll just get folks together and go out and do it. But Subsidiarity does not mean that there's no place for greater authorities like a federal government or even a United Nations in addressing problems of greater scope. Things like building interstate highways, coordinating disaster relief, or obviously responding to um, a pandemic such as COVID-19 really call for centralized authority and a greater amount of resources. But when possible, Catholic thought would privilege local control 
because it wants to encourage people to take action in their own lives, in their own communities, and thereby to grow as moral agents. So it's pretty clear how basic income fulfills the principle of subsidiarity. It's the antithesis of government control of private lives. Most government assistance programs in the US restrict who can access them and how the benefits can be used. This can keep those in need from accessing help, but Catholic social thought would see another problem. These types of restrictions embody distrust of people in need. In contrast, basic income recipients can spend their benefit however it makes sense to them. Rent, food, medicine, shoes for the kids, or they can even save it. Offering basic income suggests that we as a society want to offer help to people who struggle to meet their basic needs, but that we trust them to know best what their needs are and how to meet them. In this way, it really embodies the principle of subsidiarity. Finally, let's look at the Catholic understanding of work. Some of us might not like the idea of basic income because we don't like to think about someone being able to survive without working, even though on most basic income proposals, it, you would be living a pretty frugal lifestyle on a UBI alone. Catholic thought sees work as a deeply dignified human activity. Because human beings are so precious to God, work gains its dignity from the simple fact that a person does it, not because it has a high salary or a lot of social prestige, but just that basic fact that it's a human activity. So we certainly wouldn't want a policy that could steer people away from a really important and dignified part of human life. But we need to understand that when the church is talking about work, it's not only talking about waged employment. If it's not obvious that work is more than what we do for wages, we're paying too much attention to the financial pages and not enough to the human beings around us. Sometimes, often, the church sees the full spectrum of human experience much more clearly than we might tend to in the US. So it recognizes that, for example, family farmers don't usually work for wages. Entrepreneurs may work for months or years without drawing a salary. Volunteering or taking action for justice is work. And perhaps most obviously, that caring for children or vulnerable adults in the family is work. All very vital, important forms of work that contribute immensely to flourishing, healthy societies, but they're not important because they earn wages. In addition to its dignity, the church says that work is a duty for humans. Some have used this to argue against basic income, again, on the theory that it might be possible to live without working for wages. But really what the tradition is saying is that each of us have a duty to do some kind of useful, productive labor. Someone who lived frugally on a universal basic income could fulfill their duty to work through caregiving, getting an education, volunteering, gardening, maintaining connections among family and friends, making art, exactly the sort of productive, useful activity we'd all do more of if we didn't spend so many hours in waged work. If you think about it, it's always been possible to live without wage labor if you have the privilege of being independently wealthy. But the church's response has not been that society should forbid that kind of wealth. Rather, it says, given the freedom to do something with your days besides wage labor, what do you do with it? Earlier this year, Pope Francis addressed a group of community organizers who mostly worked in the informal economy and who'd been hard hit by the COVID pandemic. Recognizing they might be unable to work and earn wages for a while, he said this may be the time to consider a universal basic wage, which would acknowledge and dignify the noble essential tasks you carry out. As we know, not everything the Pope might say in a speech becomes part of the church's formal body of teaching, but his support for basic income in this instance is clearly in line with a century and a half plus of church teaching on basic needs subsidiarity in the nature of work, to which the Catholic social thought tradition can clearly support universal basic income. Thank you. Okay, great job. Thank you very much. Um, Catherine, you're up now arguing the negative case. Thank you. It's great to be here. And um, I want to thank Kate um, for um, advancing a strong claim. And I think we agree about some, some key features. So I think this conversation is going to be pretty interesting. Um, I'm going to start by saying I'm going to give um, a sort of an itemized list of some of my arguments here. And I'm gonna begin by um, maybe moving from the ridiculous to the sublime. So my first point um, is that I think the resolution should be rejected on a somewhat technical point, which is that the UBI is simply not a wage. So it cer certainly could not meet the standard of a just wage. So proper arguments I'm going to say about the place of the UBI in the tradition. So perhaps the, the tradition of Catholic social thought could support a UBI, but they shouldn't be in the context of the just, just wage tradition. So this is my first point. The second point um, I want to make is that the authoritative texts in the tradition, including the Catholic social thought, but also, of course, the Hebrew and Christian scriptures, 
consistently teach um, with St. Paul that if any man will not work, he should not be able to eat. Um, and also that man is called uh, to work in the image of God. So remember that um, touching line from, this, from, the, um, from the gospel, my father has never stopped working, Jesus says, and I too must be at work. So the whole model for the human race made in the image of God is to be working. And the third point, certainly if we look into the formal tradition of Catholic social teaching beyond the, um, the uh, long tradition, is that Catholic social teaching is in fact laser focused on protecting the sphere of work for men and women. Um, so ranging all the way from rerum novarum to laborum exergens, we are taught that work is the key to the social questions, actually how we solve the social question in a certain sense. Um, work is what we owe to God as an in, in image of being co-creators, an image of him. But more importantly, and this is very important, work is the means by which the dependence of children on their parents is realized, it's actualized. So the dependence of, parent, um, of, the dependence of children on parents must be actual and not fictitious. So this is a very important point for Leo the Thirteenth, and this is carried on throughout the tradition, right? So that children should, um, should not be supported by redistributive dollars from the state, if at all possible. So the fourth thing, um, as I made these couple of points about work, and I think in the value of work, I think um, Kate and I completely agree um, that the UBI is different from all other social transfer schemes, all other social transfer schemes, because it does not require or aim to protect the sphere of work at all, right? So um, every adult may choose to use this UBI however they may want to. They don't necessarily have to work. And so because of this, it's at odds, I, I, I'm going to claim, with Catholic social thought because it's exactly a kind of anti-work policy, actually. It's a policy, a policy which seeks to support able-bodied men and women who choose for any reason not to do uh, work. So even among enthusiasts of transfer programs, um, more enthusiastic than I would be, as means of correcting social inequalities, you cannot find a lot of serious support for the idea that able-bodied men and women would be paid without working. So um, for instance, those people who are large enthusiasts of social programs and tax and transfer schemes will say that wage subsidies, for instance, are much more preferred across the board as a means of supporting those whose income is not sufficient and it has less distortionary effects. So this is my, um, the next point. Um, the next point, and I'm trying to stick within um, our, our important time limit here. The next point is that the, um, getting into the specifics a little bit, a, U, a UBI um, of the kind that Kate described, something that is um, a, a made available for every citizen, even at a modestly size, which um, she did say you'd have to live very modestly, so very modestly indeed, um, a modestly sized UBI on the order of ten dollars to $12,000 per year um, per adult would cost in the order of two and a half to $3 trillion, which is more than half the size of the entire current uh, federal budget. So the levels of taxation required to support a UBI like this would certainly be in violation of the right to private property, according to the tradition, and certainly also um, practically speaking or pragmatically lead to a catastrophic economic slowdown and the deterioration of the, the employment market, which is of course what we want to protect. We would be seeing employment rates closer to the European numbers, you know, in the order of 15 to 20%. So the only serious way to fund a UBI as an alternative, in fact, um, not, uh, not this extra extraordinary level of taxation would actually be to swap out our existing non-cash transfers. Um, and then this, this brings us to a very difficult conversation, which perhaps we can engage upon, which is whether or not we're going to like the set of outcomes that a non-cash, um, that, sorry, that cash transfers will, will bring to us. Um, so this is uh, related to Kate's point about subsidiarity, letting people choose, many people will not choose to have the kinds of things that they have now under our non-cash transfers. Um, so uh, this leads me to the next point, which is that the UBI will exacerbate instances of genuine human need because um, the uh, recipients of the UBI will not have been, uh, will have been in, in this instance, um, deprived of other transfers. And in reality, uh, people will choose to spend their transfers in different ways, um, ways that perhaps are unwise to us or seem unwise to us. Um, and we don't expect then that the UBI will exacerbate instance, will in fact exacerbate instances of genuine human need and not make it better. Um, and I have two final points, which are a little bit more substantive and very brief. The first is that the UBI is not a proper function of government according to Catholic political theory. So I wanna argue in fact that subsidiarity actually asks us to reject the UBI because um, no other level of government, we, we're, we're, we are enjoined right, to put things at the lowest level, um, which, which also means that is this, an, is this an activity that lower levels of 
a civil society would engage in. So families do not seek to provide a redistributive income to every member of the group. So families don't do this, neighborhoods don't do this, churches don't do this. Um, so why should the federal government do this? Um, so this is only imaginable at the level of the nation state because we can harness the, love, the, the redistributive power of the largest possible group. So for me, this violates the principle of subsidiarity. Um, and then last, um, I kind of have two, two, two points that I want to cozy up with each other. The first is that um, the UBI is a little bit mischievous, in my opinion, because it flirts with rejecting the work gain structure of reality. So these two types of fruitfulness, which are laid out in the scripture, temporal and spiritual, we learned from the beginning that work we can work for temporal gain or for spiritual gain, and we're meant to learn about the goodness of spiritual gain by experiencing temporal gain. Um, and so it's clear that some people will still work under a UBI system and others may not, but the logic is mischievous since the law is a teacher that God has put these two things together and we should not separate them. And the final point is um, together with this one is that from work is that um, from, from, it's from work that we derive um, a substance and meaning, right? Um, it's not the only source of substance and meaning, but it's a very important one for people. So persons um, occupy this sphere of respect and honor and dignity. And um, these are the subjective values that in fact, we want to confer upon people when we do these transfer programs. We really want to, to redistribute honor and respect and dignity. And we, we are not able to do that. So in fact, the, to do that best, I wanna argue that we should protect um, an excellent labor market and low rates of unemployment instead of um, the UBI program, which I think is an anti-work program. And I'm gonna stop. Okay, that. great, great, great. Um, wow. So we covered a lot of ground, uh, audience, uh, in, in 12 minutes. Um, that was super impressive. Thanks uh, to both of you guys. Uh, it, it was really impressive in a way how you, you, you were making points that were directly against each other, um, as though you had coordinated your conversations and you had not coordinated your conversations so far as I know. So uh, I think that's actually going to prove quite fruitful for our conversation. So those of you who are listening again, um, Catch your breath, uh, take a couple of minutes uh, or to, to write down a question or two. I'm gonna start um, with some, some of my own questions that arose from your conversation. And there are a couple of places where you probably both wanna speak to each other because the conversation pretty clearly collided, right? So in a way, I think the first question um, that we're all kind of facing is the, you know, is, is occasioned by COVID, but it would be there anyway, right? Um, to some extent, the UBI conversation seems a very pre-COVID conversation to me. Um, you know, the flourishing economy, jo you know, job market um, that's growing, wages growing, uh, you know, it, and, and now we know that those aren't in place any longer, right? And Catherine made the, the point, Kate, that uh, we simply can't afford it. I mean, this, to, to sort of sum it up, like we, we really can't, our economy can't afford um, a UBI, I think Catherine was probably making it in a kind of general sense, like even, even in a flourishing economic situation, we really can't afford it. So how would you respond to this idea? Can we afford a universal um, basic education? And in a way, it's a much more you know, immediate question given um, the different economic conditions that, were, that are prevailing now than were in February of this past year. Sure. Um... I, so I'm not an economist, right? Catherine is. Um, Catherine, maybe you could talk a little bit about how you predict the impact on the economy from the average family having 10,000 more a year to spend, right? Because it's not as if those funds vanish. Um, I mean, I don't know. I'm sure there are different arguments for who the parties would be, who should be taxed. Most of the the argument, most of the UBI plans that I've seen do involve replacing certain um, more targeted benefits programs. So, like you said, it wouldn't be a net, um, it wouldn't be a total increase of the amount that we need to tax because certain benefits programs would be replaced. Um, but it seems to me that having more money to spend in the hands of ordinary families would provide a significant economic boom because similarly to the uh, stimulus. So in a way, this is maybe sort of a current uh, question for our COVID, our COVID addled minds, right? We got these stimulus checks, average families spent them. That's money that goes back into the economy. So what would you envision the impact of that being? Um, so, so transfer programs in general shouldn't be like stimulus programs because 
um, their transfer programs. So we're taking money from some households and moving them to other households. So it doesn't change the net amount of, of money that people can spend. We don't think of other types of transfer programs as being um, like a stimulus because they're, they're because they're transfers. So it's yes. just moving it from one right from one spending uh, household to another. Yeah. But isn't it the case that wealthy households don't spend all they earn, right? They have a pretty significant amount of savings and maybe money and investments. They're, they're not literally taking it to the corner store, you know, every month. Um, true, true. But those savings are invested in places where, which tend to be productive in a certain sense. They're part of, they are part of the economy. They're not under a mattress, right? If they're under a mattress, then your point would be correct. Um, yeah. So they're circulating. They're still circulating in, throughout the economy in some way, um, yeah. and having for allowing for the benefits that you anticipate. You're anticipating might actually be diminished in some respect if they are transferred in these ways. Or Catherine, or would there be some other adverse effects that you think would come as a consequence of this? Aside from the moral ones, just the economic ones we're focusing on. Yeah. I mean, the. I mean, I think the biggest. Um, I mean, I guess I would say that, I mean, having spoken to some more macroeconomists and more of a microeconomist, most of them don't see, um, don't see sort of macro general equilibrium effects as arising from the UBI. Um, again, mainly because it's a transfer program and we, we don't think of other transfer programs as, as having that kind of effect. I mean, certainly it redistributes where the spending dollars go exactly. They're just still in the economy, right? Um, we're just moving them from one place to the other. Um, I mean, the biggest practical problem in terms of can we afford it is just that, um, and, and why I think most economists are going to reject it uh, and do, do reject it, is that um, to do so, I mean, most economists who are um, fairly mainstream are, are really quite behind our, our current programs of, of non-cash transfers. Um, and these have been developed for, for years in certain ways, really crafted in order to try to in fact, solve um, genuine human needs. I mean, so we've actually, we're pretty good at this. Um, I mean, you know, like nothing's perfect, but we're pretty good at this. Um, so we worry that if we stop providing food assistance, housing assistance, medicine assistance, because you'd have to swap that out to get the UBI done, that significant numbers of people would not actually um, pursue a program of economic security. Not to mention that actually the, the, the cash amount we could do in a UBI is actually much smaller than the current amount that people are receiving in their non-cash transfers. So if you total up all of the medicine, health, food, housing assistance that we're now giving, and then you swap that out for the UBI, because why? Because the UBI covers all of the adults, not just the needy adults, right? It's not means tested. So you have to, you have to send your payout to a lot more people. You send your payout to a lot of you know, single 25 year olds who aren't supporting children or anything like that. So that becomes, um, you have to be less generous with more people. So we would be yeah. giving a much smaller amount, yep. Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, no, yeah, so a, a questioner, one of, one of the audience members asked a question which seems related to this, both you and Kate. Kate you, or, or Catherine, are you guys aware of any empirical research that's been done on UBIs? I mean, is there any sense of how um, or what happens as a consequence of UBIs in places where these may already be in place? Is there empirical evidence? Kate, I, I, I'll let you go first if you'd like. Yeah, I am, I am aware of some. Um, so it's not been tested at the level of an entire country, right? But it's been tested um, in communities like Native American reservations or Native American communities who distribute the proceeds from casinos. Mm -hmm. um, in Alaska, there's the Alaska Permanent Fund, which is does not reach the level of, of a subsistence, but it's a non-mean tested grant to every resident. It's being tested in cities and it's also being tested um, in much poorer contexts through the program Give Directly. So um, they're following, for example, two villages in Kenya for 20 years and one uh, village, all the residents are getting a UBI, the other is not. So there actually is a lot of um, real world evidence behind UBI that I find very compelling um, in two ways, right? And it's its impact on basic needs and human flourishing, that it um, not just does the things you'd expect, like people eat better, you know, people are more likely to complete their education, 
um, but reduces things like suicide, dependence on drug and alcohol. So this is something you can see, for example, on native reservations who um, have about 20 years of experience with this to back it up. Um, it gives kids, you know, the ability to think that they can achieve something because they have that little start of a financial cushion. Um, so there's the basic needs argument, but there's also the fact that it doesn't really seem to depress participation in the waged workforce much, um, with the exception of mothers of young kids, which I think is something both Catherine and I would be very comfortable with. Great, great. Let me let me let me move us on to another place where you guys were possibly in kind of stark disagreement with each other, or you were using language differently. Okay, and that was when um, Catherine, you made the argument that this is that the UBI is essentially anti-work, right? Um, and through much of um, your uh, present, initial presentation, you were using the term work in a way that I think Kate would probably um, want to expand, right? Want, would want to sort of say, look, that's, it's too narrow a conception, right? You're using it in terms of wage, right? We're talking about wage work. So is, so is UBI anti-work? Kate, on the one hand, was making the case, in fact, it's not. If you expand the conception of work, beyond simply wage work, number one, you're still going to have people who are doing work for pay because it's, you know, it's not a high level of living, um, you know, the UPI that, uh, that it supports, but also you're going to have the other kinds of things which we ought to you call work, right, that people will be now freed up to do, right, volunteering, um, you know, you, you mentioned like family farming, you know, some other instances of things that are not currently compensated that perhaps we don't typically sort of classify as work. So, is it really anti-work, I guess, um, if you want to broaden the notion of, the, of work in the way that Kate suggested, Catherine? Okay, so I'm going to say that it is anti-work from the perspective of social policy, right? So um, precisely because um, it's a policy which lays out payment for no reciprocal um, activity, right? Um, it's not anti-work in this in this broader conception of work. I mean, I'm not even sure what that would mean to be anti-work in that in that sense. But as a policy, uh, what we're doing is we're setting up a policy which says we're going to now, in fact, reward all kinds of um, means of living, even living which does not involve um, a particular commitment to work with a, with a financial payment. So in some sense, it gets inside. I mean, so if we even want to consider bringing um, you know, the, the work that women do in the home into this sphere, I think it just distorts the idea of what wage labor is for. You say, well, what we wanna expand the idea of work and include all these non-wage um, non things. Of course we do. Uh, I just don't think we need to attach a financial payment for them. So um, you know, for everybody that's gonna use a UBI in a sort of a good way, you're gonna have you know, hundreds of thousands of people who are using it to, you know, it, to do something else. I mean, it doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. So in that sense, as a social policy, it's an anti-work social policy. Um, okay. Kate, do you want to yeah, Kate. Separately. Yeah. yeah, Kate, do you want to respond to that? Yeah, sure. Um, you know, I do think there are times when we try to use social policy to, to encourage people to do things besides wage labor. Um, like actually in Milwaukee, there's a very proud tradition of this, of um, the the great, you know, uh, mayors and some of um, the philanthropists of the city wanting to build a city that would encourage people to go out to museums and parks and spend time with their families. And obviously this is not limited to Milwaukee, right? I think this is a really praiseworthy thing that we could do with a social policy. Um, obviously you don't have to do that by paying people to do that. But I think we can all tell from our own experience, um, there are some things it's just easier to do if you have a little bit of financial breathing room, right? Like find the time to go stand in line to vote, to visit the elderly, you know, in your parish, um, certainly to spend more time with your kids, um, to keep up your home, you know, for its property values, to garden. Um, yeah, I, I think those are, are re within the remit of a good social policy um, from, from the point of view of Catholic social thought. Great, I think thank there, you. Sorry, yeah, I think no, please. I want to support those things, but I'm not sure that attaching an individual kind of wage-like subsidy to them is the, like the best way to encourage them. But 
Yeah, so so one one thing that um, perhaps we also should make sure we're on the same page about is, Catherine, you're using the, this language of wage-like subsidy and so on to describe the universal base, basic income. So it so it it has in essence the appearance of being a kind of quid pro quo where there's no quid, right? Um, you, if I understand what you're saying and. Kate, is that how you would understand? Is that how we should understand the UBI? Is it a wage-like thing, or is it some other? Is it best understood in some other way? Um, what do you think about that, Kate? Yeah, thank you. Um, I because I want to say that too. I think I agree with Catherine. I I don't like thinking of it as a wage, right? There is something about saying we're going to pay you to take care of your kids, right? That feels really off. Um, I don't think of it that way. I think of it more as a way of saying, you know, many people throughout their lives will, um, you know, fall short of meeting their basic needs in some way. Um, and rather than trying to anticipate and target every way that might be, you know, we're going to offer a, a floor that they can't fall below. So people can then choose to live very close to that if they want to you know, be an artist and live with four of the roommates and spend all their time making art and not working for wages, or, you know, it can smooth between the gaps when you graduate college and don't have a job yet, you want to take some time off, you know, for childcare, or elder care, um, maybe to start a business, that, that's my image of it would be more of a floor. Great, thank you. Um, one final question for me before I turn to some of the questions from the audience, I've already integrated one, um, but another one is, both of you are, it seems like, are making assumptions about the human person. Uh, you know, the, uh, there's, a, there's definitely working here um, either a shared conception of the way human beings will react to or respond to um, either, you know, the, in, the, the UBI, um, the economy as it's affected by it, and so on. Do you think that you're each talking about the same kind of human person, or are you sensing there's some disagreement um, here? about how human beings will in fact respond to or would respond to something like a UBI. Catherine, you wanna take a swing at that first and Kate, you can go. Well, I could start by making a joke about economists, um, which wouldn't be uh, maybe not unwelcome here. Uh, so I'd be poking fun at myself. I mean, right. So economists are always gonna start by saying, well, people respond to incentives and so on and so forth. And then, um, right. well, I don't know, I will, I'll leave the theologians out because I'm in conversation with two of them, not one. But of course, uh, philosophers at least might maybe start talking about how, how people ought to be, right? And so we always have this sort of realist versus idealist. Uh, you know, and I, I don't want to put you in that category, but I would say that certainly um, the, the claim I try to um, arc, you know, provide some architecture for in my very quick introduction, this is a claim that you know, sort of this idea about people responding to incentives is kind of baked into reality. That's sort of my yeah. view. Um, but I don't think that's something that came out of like Econ 101. I mean, I'm pretty sure that, that that's sort of part of this thing that goes all the way back, at least to the fall. <laughs> like, you know, and I'm not sure right. what was happening before the fall, but I feel that it must have been happening at least after the fall that we don't any longer do the things we ought to do merely because we ought to do them. So I'm certainly operating on that sort of idea that sort of a, a work and gain um, structure is, is baked into who we are and, and pretty important and that God sort of envisioned of us as being the sorts of people who need some incentives to do the right thing. Well, well, thanks on behalf of the theologians for mentioning sin or at least alluding to sin. Catherine, we both appreciate that. Kate, what about you? Do you guys think you're talking about this? Do you think you're talking about the same person here? It does sound like we're talking about a different one, doesn't it? And yeah, I know exactly what you mean, Catherine, because the hardest thing that I have to convince my student. Well, I don't, I don't think I do convince them. I'm always trying to tell my students, you know, humans are by nature good, although flawed. And they're like, no, they're not, they're terrible. And, <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think I am operating under that a little bit. I do maybe start with um, what people should do, but I think UBI keeps the built-in incentives. I don't think it gets rid of them because still at, at the end of the year, you know, you could, you could drink yourself under the table every night, or you could have $10,000 left at the end of the year, right? I, I think it actually keeps those economic incentives for the average individual. Okay, great. So let's move on to, uh, to some of the questions that um, people have asked. Uh, one of them, uh, 
they're, they're all excellent questions. This one is, is a really good one. It's, it's very similar to the kind of question that, that has been put in the past to just the notion of a living or a just wage in the Catholic tradition. And this uh, audience member asks, how can we create an equitable UBI with such different costs of living in different cities? So it's a very practical minded question, right? Our country is big and obviously it's extremely different from place to place. How could a federal UBI, right, um, really attend to the difference between, you know, let's say $1,800 a month or $1,200 a month in Washington, D.C. and $1,200 a month in, you know, small town Virginia or small town West Virginia or Alaska, et cetera. Hey, you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I, I'm not actually aware of policies that do, uh, or proposals, I mean, for UBI that do try to differentiate in that way. Ra rather, what I think we'd see happening is um, more people moving to areas with a lower cost of living um, if they had a UBI, if folks wanted to try to make a go of it, you know, to start a business or to really live frugally and be an artist or something. I mean, art artists already do this, right? Um, a neat thing about living in Wisconsin is sometimes you'll go to a rural area and find some artist gallery because they can live very frugally there. Um, so I think, and again, a, an appeal of the proposal from a more small government point of view is that it minimizes bureaucracy, right? So the, the easiest thing to do is cut an equal check to everyone, no means testing, no, you know, applying different standards in different cases. Um, so I think that tailoring it for different income levels is not a part of the UBI proposals that I'm familiar with, but. Right, right. Um, Catherine, anything? Yeah, I mean, I just want to say that that's my understanding as well. I haven't seen one that um, makes cost of living adjustments. That being said, we could, do, we could do that. It wouldn't be impossible to do it. We have lots of indices of prices and so on and so forth. I mean, really great data. We could do that if we want to. But I agree with Kate. Um, if anybody does, I mean, if you find economists out there who support a UBI, they do so on the grounds that it's more efficient, that we could sort of eliminate all of these cumbersome efficient programs and just replace it with a single check that we cut to folks. Um, and so that would definitely, I mean, if we did a lot of adjustments for cost of living, it would definitely impinge upon its, its efficiency improvements. Okay, great. Thank you both. Okay, so uh, another question. Does the Catholic tradition distinguish between work and meaningful work? Okay, work and meaningful work. Catherine, you, go, you can go first this time. Are you aware of a, a distinction drawn here? Y yeah, I mean, so I'm, maybe I'm going to now, I don't know if I'm going to take the economist view or the non-economist view, but I'm gonna say that the Catholic tradition um, places the nexus of meaning on, in sort of the subjective person. And so um, I think the Catholic tradition would wanna say that there isn't uh, particularly meaningful work and any, that any job, however menial or however monotonous, even if it's not an ideal job for a person to have, when we can all agree that there are jobs that are not ideal for a person to have, that any job, no matter how menial can be an act of love, it can be very dignifying and have lots of meaning. So I would say that the tradition does not distinguish. What about you, Kate? Same view? Yes, exactly. Um, one category the tradition would use, and this is what Catherine's talking about, would be alienating work, right? Work that is, um, doesn't help the human develop their nature. So, for example, it's very monotonous or harmful, maybe very physically dangerous um, or something like that. But um, But that still wouldn't remove the meaning from the work because that's still a human acting. Um, right, just as God works when God creates. Um, so even uh, alienating work that's not necessarily good for the human nature um, still has dignity, and I think we would say has meaning for all those reasons Catherine said. Okay. How would the UBI affect the employer-employee relationship? Uh, do you have any sense of how, um, this is, I guess, you know, one of these, I think, almost a million kinds of questions you could ask along the lines of what might be the intended or unintended effects of a policy like this, right? So how would the UBI, or how does it, if we, if we have any empirical evidence on this, how does it or would it affect this relationship between employer and employee? What do you think, Kate? Start with you. If you can't tell guys at this point, I'm alternating. <laughs> um. I think it would strengthen uh, employee power a little bit, right? Again, if, if you think of it as a floor, um, having the option, 
uh, as a last ditch to walk away from a job where you're being mistreated um, or underpaid, uh, I think could give people more flexibility as employees um, to uh, have a little bit more power in the labor market. Um, it, I know I'm forgetting her name right now, but there's a feminist scholar who's argued strenuously for it, specifically in terms of protecting women in the workplace um, by giving them more freedom to walk away from harassing situations. Mm -hmm. Catherine, what do you think? Uh, I think you can tell the story both ways. I think Kate's story is a plausible story, but I think you can also imagine a story that um, sort of, when we think about the, the role that employers have, we'd like, to, we'd like them to have a family spirit, a protective attitude towards their employees when they perceive that employees have a sort of a little bit of an extra cushion someplace, they may be more inclined to sort of cut certain kinds of benefits at work or to make the, like to, you know, to, 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 you know, well, we don't really need to have that extra perk around here. So I think you could tell the story both ways. It would be difficult um, to in fact imagine it out without sort of more, more empirical experience. Great. Um, the, ne the next question is one very similar to one I had myself. Um, how do you think the uh, UBI might impact the family, right? Um, so if we think about how it might impact work relationships, it seems also that it's, it's vital we think about how it actually might affect the nuclear family, right? Um, especially as the, as the questioner asks, with the state providing ubiquitous support and supplanting the traditional, traditional role of the family, or you might say the traditional role of the earner within the family, right? Um, do, are there any anticipatable impacts here that it might have? Okay, and since I'm alternating, who went la who went first last time? That was Kate. That's right. So Catherine, it's your question first. Yeah. So I mean, this is. Um, I think again, we kind of have to separate theory from empirics. Um, I mean, I th I think the theory on this would take a much more pessimistic view than the empirics, and I think the empirics are are less pessimistic because I think you just can't get a UBI done that's big enough that's going to actually replace the role of a father in a family. Um, but the theory on this would be pessimistic. I mean, for me, those um, that second bit of the opening of Verum Novarum, where Pope Leo moves from sort of you know here's a here's a strong defense of individual right to private property, very strong, and then he goes and if you're not convinced, this is all a lot stronger when we think about the role of fathers, you know, and mothers as heads of households, and he says that the dependence of children on families has to be has to be uh, real and not kind of. Um, not a placeholder. Like the father can't be a placeholder who's funneling support from the state. You know, again, he says, like, except in the most extreme circumstances, because he said he says, well, this is a sacred obligation of the father, and it has to be protected. So I guess I would say, like, in theory, if we could really support families in this redistributive way through the state, then I I would be extremely worried about it. Um, but in practice, since we're talking about maybe a ten or twelve thousand um, dollar payment um, per person, we're not going to be doing too much harm, although I know I, I worry a little bit about the instructive power of the law. Um, so. It might change the life of some professors, Catherine, uh, right? Um, <laughs> you're right. You're a little here. joke there. Uh, Kate. Yes. Uh, yeah, I'm a little confused by the premise. Does a child tax credit supplant the role of the earner in the family? It seems to me the parents are still deciding how to spend the resources and you know, how many toys the child gets and um, when they have to do their homework. So I'm a little confused by the premise. I think it would be life-changing for families. Um, I, I'm interesting, it would be life-changing for so many families. The, the idea that 10 or 12,000 a year is not a big change for many US families, that I wish that were the case. So you think it would be a sort of clear positive um, for families to have more disposable income, uh, and it you know it's almost puzzling to think that it would have any kind of negative effects on. Uh, okay, I, I see. Right. So yeah. is is there a worry about um, luxury, the vice of luxury, right? Um, having more disposable incomes. Uh, I, I I'm not sure that that's how I put it. Um, you know, for sure. I'm not. I'm not saying that. You know that. You know the the fam these families were describing to go to Vegas and blow their ten, you know, <laughs> blow through their ten to twelve thousand dollars. I think the idea more is again, as you think through a social policy like this of, you know, both enormous cost but enormous possible like sort of good, um, in the way you just described for many American families 
might there not be some anticipative, anticipatable effects on um, the way they regard each other? I, 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 again, I think one of the, to me, one of the most interesting things about this and even hearing the two of you speak through this, um, and again, there's a lot of, I think on the one hand, agreement or like sensibility that's shared between the two of you, even though there's some disagreement. But one of the things that's fascinating to me is almost like the psych human psychology, right? That we're kind of talking or we're trying to like, we're kind of constructing as we think through this, right? And, and a question, you know, that just kind of, that's in the back of my mind is when the state is providing, let's say one fourth of a family's income, right? Um, you know, and the father or the mother who's the primary wage earner is, you know, providing the rest, but the state is providing some significant percentage of it, does that not impact the way the family thinks of each other, right? The way maybe the father and the mother regard each other or the children regard the parent who is the primary earner. Um, I, I just don't know, but it seems like it would, be, it would be rash not to think it does impact the way these relationships, you know, sort of engage, you know, engage each other. I, I, that's how I understand that question to sort of be asking. I want to make a small distinguishing comment and then yeah. maybe back to Kate for her comments. Um, I, I don't disagree in, uh, at all that ten or $12,000 would make an enormous difference, but a tax credit is different. A tax credit is money that the father has earned or the mother has earned, which is going back to the family. Um, so I, I distinguish very much um, in terms of the um, maybe cultural effects, which is what I understand Joe to be asking, that the cultural effects of having Ten or twelve thousand extra in my pocket, which are handed to me by the state as part of this redistributive plan, would be very different from receiving back as a tax credit on on the grounds that I'm that I'm raising children. Um, but it's back that money that I earned or that the, my, my my husband and I earned for our children. But I do think that would be a culturally different thing, even though the amount of money in the pocket at the end of the day would look the same. And I agree with you that on that order of magnitude, that would make a big difference to me. I think we have time for maybe only one or two more questions. Um, so let me let me go back to the audience um, for another one. Are there any other ways of trying to resolve the same kinds of questions, um, Kate, that you identified at the very beginning? You know, the, the, the same kinds of issues with regard to poverty um, and um, family income that maybe they're not the UBI, but there's something else. Um, is there, are there other alternatives that would try to respond at the local level in the way the UBI does, um, but maybe don't have some of the downsides that we've identified today. Yeah, local programs. I mean, I, I think we know what local programs look like, right? Um, food banks, you know, um, they, they do wonderful work um, and they are doing wonderful work and we still see these gaps, right? Um, a program that, uh, Catholic social thought has explicitly supported in the encyclicals is family grants, um, which are common in Western Europe. You know, I can see the logic there and I don't, I'm not sure I have a preference between a UBI or family grants. It seems to me that a UBI um, by making a grant to adult supports the adult's freedom in a way um, that, I, and again, it's it's just kind of an, it's almost aesthetic where the idea of attaching money to a child, it strikes me as a little off, but but again, the tradition supports it. And I think that's a really minor quibble on my part. Okay, okay thank you, Kate. Catherine, what about you? Are there any, are you aware of any other alternatives? Um, well, we can keep doing what we're doing now. Um, okay. <laughs> So, so alternative to what is the question, right? So alternative to the UBI that is trying to, I guess, trying to dis disrupt the regular UBI, way. Right? I mean, do we want a UBI in order to sort of free people up or do we want a UBI to sort of eliminate basic need? So those are two different things. So my argument is that in terms of eliminating basic need, the current uh, non-cash transfers do a much better job and that if we were to switch away, um, I actually happen to prefer, like many um, many other economists, if it were me, I would probably prefer um, I would probably prefer a situation in which we swapped out a lot of the um, non-cash transfers for sort of cash transfers, which we allow people to spend in certain ways. But I just do not see them as politically feasible. Okay, um, great. All right, so now we're going to move on to uh, the next uh, section of our uh, 
conversation tonight, and that's your summation arguments. And Kate, we begin with you, and then Catherine, you'll go. Um, each of you gets up to four minutes uh, and no more than four minutes, okay? Um, thank you. So we're talking a lot about work, um, and it's true that Catherine and I were, were using the term in different ways. Um, I would posit that some of our current anti-poverty programs uh, are in fact discouraging of work because of the fact that benefits shrink um, as a person earns more income. UBI doesn't have that drawback. Whatever you earn on top of a UBI is yours to keep. Um, I think we were told we weren't supposed to make new arguments in the closing. I just wanted to get that out there. <laughs> Catherine, since you're going after me, I hope that's okay. Um, I think that uh, there are many things we wanna promote um, as a society, right? In our public policy. Wage work is certainly one of them, right? Productive activity, the productive activity that all of us do is um, crucial to so many others who we don't necessarily help out of our benevolence. I'm stealing an economist line, right? But because we get something back out of it um, and we need people to be doing those things. I guess I do think positively enough about human nature to find that many, many people would still do those things even if they had a floor they couldn't fall below. Um, I like to think of them being able to do it with a floor they couldn't fall below. Um, I also like to think, and I think our society can get behind the idea of wanting people to be able to take time off to care for a child, um, to recover from an illness, to you know help settle an elderly parent into a care facility um, without having to suddenly stop their only source of income. Um, so UBI, I think, can support work in its expansive sense um, in this way very well. We also talked about the idea of subsidiarity. Um, folks on the right like UBI because it participates in the existing economic incentives that we understand, right? If you spend it, you don't have it anymore, um, but you can spend it on whatever you want or you can save it. You can spend it in ways that help you reach a larger goal like education. You can use it to start a business. You're not limited to you know X amount of food at a certain kind of store. Um, this is way above my pay grade, but I believe there's also an understanding um, that it doesn't contribute to market imbalances in some way because it does preserve that diversity of how people can spend it. As a theologian, um, I would really want us to resist the idea that um, giving assistance to people is something we don't want in our society or that receiving it is something people should be ashamed of. Um, we're all dependent on each other we see how our need to buy and consume things, right, and receive services. We're dependent on other people for those, even if we're paying for them. So the fact that someone is dependent and at the current moment they're in need doesn't make their dependence any worse or less worthy of response than mine. Um, and I, I'm not implying that anyone here thinks that, right, since this is a, a group that's interested in Christian ideals, but this is something that comes up a lot, and I did just want to put that out there. Um, so this is why the church claims that having basic needs met is a right. Um, one's, one's right to something imposes a corresponding duty on other people. Um, some of us in the US like to think that government is something over and above us. Thank you. The church doesn't, government is all of us working together um, and we can work together through it to um, offer support to others to put that floor under them um, UBI would be a great way to do it. I don't think UBI is the only policy Catholic social thought can support, but I think that it certainly can support a UBI. And I'll stop there. Great. Thank you so much, Kate. Catherine. Okay. So again, um, no new arguments, but um, um, like Kate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sneak one thing in there. <laughs> um, I was going to say that just if I can make a point of humor, um, we've all seen a bunch of um, debates lately and uh, in contrast, we're sort of tripping, tripping over each other to make sure the, the other party gets more time in. And I don't know what, uh, what caused that difference here, but uh, that's a very, it's a, it's a pleasure. Um, so, but my tiny little point is that um, basic, when, uh, when we have a right to some things, certain things, we have a right because we have some sort of obligation to meet. 
Um, and it's not always obvious to me, at least, and I don't think to the tradition that a right puts a claim on everyone else. It may, in fact, put a claim on ourselves first and foremost. Um, so if I have um, a right to something, it may be that I'm the first person who needs to try to meet that need, that basic need. Um, so I guess uh, just to give a very brief, you know, now three minutes of sum summing up. I mean, my first basic point is that the UBI under the current proposals is essentially impossible or impractical. Um, it, if we were to add it, to super add it on top of existing uh, transfer programs, um, it would be uh, a, it would require a crushing level of taxation that would really quite uh, quite hinder the labor market in general. Uh, we would probably uh, be looking at unemployment rates in the range of 15 to 20 percent. Um, and then when we consider the fact that the UBI cannot replace real income, I mean it's a it's a boost. I mean the the programs we have are so small, 10 to 12 10 to 12 thousand dollars. So it's impossible and impractical if we supplant the existing non-cash transfers. I am um, I'm I'm quite attracted to the idea that we just let people do what they want with their with their cash, but they're going to get a lot less of it than they get now in their cash their non-cash transfers. So I'm um, I'm I would be concerned that the people who have the greatest need uh, would not actually have enough cash under a UBI uh, to meet their basic needs. So I think it would exacerbate genuine need. Um, and, and certainly in that sense, exacerbate inequalities that we that we worry about. Uh, so that's my first sum, summary point. The second summary point is that I think a much more effective way to do that is actually to improve the opportunities for people to um, to access work at all at all levels. And that's to improve the labor mar labor market. And in general, you know, we see this kind of principle that is very hard to get around that to improve the labor market and get things uh, working. We want to, to support kind of pro work, pro growth strategies which typically mean lower rates of taxation and smaller size of federal government as these things typically are um, at odds in a practical sense. Um, and then the last point, maybe uh, just wanna round out my point about subsidiarity, which, um, which, which for me is that, um, that the, uh, the sensible things that we think of the highest level of government doing have to be things which mirror in some way what lower orders of society are, are doing. And um, I, I can't envision any functioning family um, providing a, a sort of a like a, an income floor for their able-bodied adults. I mean, I, I'm hardly interested in, in providing such a thing to my older teenagers, right? Um, you know, think about like this sort of thing in, in um, encroaching upon people and, you know, turn, we, we even have uh, parables about this. So kind of wondering about the prodigal son recently. So, um, so I don't see this as a function of the family, right? So if it's not a function of the family, it's not the sort of thing that families would ever try to do, um, then why is it the sort of thing that the government should try to do? Whereas of course in families, we look to take care of people's basic needs when they fall in hard times. We do that in families. And when at the level of the state, certain families cannot do that, it makes a lot of sense. It's consistent with subsidiarity that higher orders of government would look after those things. So that's how I see this as being um, not really jibing with the principle of subsidiarity. So that is it. Great, Catherine, great. Kate, um, really wonderful jobs um, from both of you guys. Uh, audience, thank you so much for your questions. If you've not yet done the post-debate poll, please um, take a moment to do so. Um, I am going to tell you uh, the results. I think, you know, since you took the poll, it's only fair that you, you're aware of it. Before, the, before we had our wonderful conversation, 23 of you, 23% uh, of you were in favor of uh, the resolution, 52% of you were against it, and 26% of you were unsure. Um, so it's, it looks like we informed you at least uh, at the end of the debate uh, the total I'm looking at right now, it says 22% of you are unsure. So 4% of you um, became convicted as a consequence of our conversation. And, and I think that that's probably a good thing. 56% um, of you uh, view it negatively. So that rose slightly and um, uh, the affirmative case dipped a little bit uh, to 22%. So Again, great, just a great conversation. And, and to Catherine's point, um, her humorous point, which is nonetheless, unfortunately, a serious point, um, what we did today um, was act like adults, right? We had uh, disagreements, um, uh, you know, some fundamental disagreements, uh, but we aired those disagreements with civility um, and with clarity, uh, and I think in a, in a fruitful way. And, and that's, 
unfortunately, increasingly rare in the public sphere. So uh, I, I wanna pat both um, Catherine and Kate virtually on the back um, for being so polite with each other, so honest and clear with each other. Um, this is serious stuff. Our tradition invites us to think through um, its implications for the way we live our lives in political community. Uh, and that's one thing we did uh, tonight. So again, thank you um, to my audience. Thank you to the Catholic Information Center for co-sponsoring this with us at the IHE.